Okay, skilled abnormalities. Really difficult, very challenging. Do you agree? You agree with me? Yes. I, I personally find it very challenging. So what are the objectives or what are we going to um, cover? We're going to cover what are the normal um, skeleton milestones. And it's really important to know so that you know what you expect, what is the normal. So when you don't see it or you see something different, you know that this is abnormal. Um, how do you do systematic assessment of a fetus with skeletal abnormality? So if you pick up something, um, how do you actually go through systematically to try to find the diagnosis, to get the diagnosis? We're going to talk about limb abnormalities um, and terminology, especially limb abnormalities that you're likely to pick up or come across in the first trimester or early in pregnancy. And the last thing I'm going to touch very briefly, not, not in a detail, don't worry, about the early signs of skeletal dysplasia or some of the conditions of skeletal dysplasia that we published on the early um, signs. <coughs> So what's the normal? Well, you expect to see the limb buds by ultrasound scan from eight weeks. You expect to see the femur, a humerus, by nine weeks. The tibia, fibula, radius, ulna, by 10 weeks. You expect to be able to see the digits of the hands and the feet by 11 weeks. And you should expect to see the body movements by nine weeks. It is really challenging, and it's, it's not just me, experts even, um, will say that it is quite challenging to reach a diagnosis in the first trimester. Not just in the first trimester, even the rest of the pregnancy. Why? Because actually most of the skeletal abnormalities, or skeletal dysplasias in particular, are rare, and the majority of them are case reports. Um, the other thing that often we need other investigations to get the final diagnosis. So not all the cases you'll be able to get the diagnosis by ultrasound scan alone. Often you might need to do karyotype or um, radiological examinations um, or pathological examination or genetic um, testing after delivery, whether in the neonatal period or on uh, post-mortem, for example, if this woman has termination. I think it is easier if this woman have already um, a family history, or she had a previous pregnancy affected, or you know that this family have carry a, a certain um, genetic mutation. But that's not the usual case. If it's an incidental finding, it is really difficult. It's quite challenging to actually get the final diagnosis uh, accurately. So that means we really need to have a systematic examination. So if you have, if you come across a fetus that have um, uh, skeletal abnormality, so you need to measure all the long bones, ideally bilaterally, because there are some certain conditions will only affect unilateral, like unilateral um, uh, femoral hyperplasia, for example, so only could be one side. So you will miss it if you don't measure both sides. The other thing, you need to look at the shape of the bones. Are these bones are straight, or they bolt, or they bent? <coughs> The mineralization, something like osteogenesis imperfecta or achondrogenesis, the key feature, the cardinal features, will be a hypomineralization. And then you need to comment on the fetal movements because there are certain abnormalities that will only affect the fetal movements. The other thing, certainly a large proportion of, of uh, skeletal abnormalities will have associated abnormalities, but in particular, so when I write my report, I comment on the limb, all these uh, points, and then I'll comment on these systems particularly because they are really have quite a specific relevance in cases with skeletal abnormalities. So, for example, the thorax, if you have a small thorax, that would be, that would be sort of, would determine whether this condition is lethal or not, or likely to be lethal or not. So it's really crucial to comment on the chest and the ribs. Head, a lot of the skeletal dysplasias have um, um, head features as well, with a macrocephaly, with an abnormal shape of the head, or frontal pulsing, and so on. Um, again, the spine abnormalities is one of the things that are um, commonly associated. And then apart from that, apart from the related systems, the associated abnormalities, in particular the heart and the kidney. So there are certain skeletal dysplasias where are commonly you see heart abnormalities or renal abnormalities. <coughs> So this is, this is why I propose, or this is why it's even proposed from the literature, uh, to follow a systematic um, 
method or a systematic examination in a case of um, suspected skeletal abnormality. So how good we are, do you think, if, would you be really upset if you miss a skeletal abnormality in the first trimester? Well, ideally we shouldn't, but don't be very upset if you do. Because this is data from um, Kipros. This is a very large screening study, more than 60,000 women that were screened in the first trimester. And they were really screened by fellows that really do thorough, thorough assessment and thorough examination. And in this, in there, in this, um, in this series, um, only 60% of absent hands and feet were actually detected in the first trimester. So about 40% were missed in the first trimester. And this is in one of the best centers in the world. So we're not very good in, in picking up these abnormalities in the first trimester. But certainly we should improve and we should aim to be better. And there are certain terminology that we really need to be familiar with. Um, micromelia, so that means it's, uh, the, the whole limp is short. Um, rhizomelia, rhizo means proximal, so that means this is the proximal long bones that are affected. Mesomelia means meso in the middle, so that would be the middle bone, the long bones. And acromelia is the distal. And that, the, the reason they are important are important that when you actually assess the fetus with a potential skeletal dysplasia or abnormality is that you, because the, the pattern of the abnormalities that you're going to see would actually be linked or can give you a clue to which abnormality. So for example, micromedia is something you can see in achondrogenesis, short trip polydactyly, diastrophic dysplasia, osogenesis imperfecta. Rhizomedia is achondroplasia. I'm not going to really cover achondroplasia in this talk because this is, this is really focusing on early um, skeletal abnormalities. Echondroplasia, you, you don't really see anything in the first trimester. It's usually completely normal. The bones, none of the features really are usually seen in the first trimester. But there is a potential of diagnosis, and I'm going to cover that at the end of the talk, particularly if you have a family history or if a family that are known to carry um, echondroplasia. Nowadays, you could actually offer tests in the first trimester to see whether this fetus have um, echondroplasia or not. Before the appearance of any ultrasound features, which is often not apparent until 25 weeks. So not even the, the anomaly scan. Um, when I said about commenting on the shape of the bones, the long bones, are they actually straight or they bowed or bent? What's the difference between bowed and bent? Well, bowed is, is actually curved, but it's quite a smooth curvature, while bent is usually a sharp angle. Bent is usually associated with fractures, which is characteristic of osteogenesis imperfecta, for example. This is what you will usually see pent femur. The bowed femur um, is, is quite a common finding in many skeletal dysplasias. Um, obviously, the commonest lethal skeletal dysplasia is anatophoric dysplasia, which again, I mean, now commonly we see it, or uh, hopefully we should be able to diagnose it early in pregnancy because the features are quite severe, quite marked. Uh, but other things like campomelic dysplasia, achondrogenesis, and hypophosphatasia. So there are skeletal dysplasias where commonly you will see both uh, femurs. Um, and just I should put this picture just to show you how short these long bones in the, in the first trimester can be. I mean, they're really, really short. It's, it hardly can be measured. Um, <coughs> the other thing is the mineralization. And it is something that sometimes often strikes you actually when you do the ultrasound scan. Characteristically, when you do and you look, you start looking at the brain of the head, you can see the brain so clearly in the first trimester to the extent that you might subjectively think that there is actually ventricular megaly because you could see the ventricles so clearly and you don't see the skull. And hypomineralization is a characteristic feature in echondrogenesis osteogenesis imperfecta, and hypophosphatasia. Most of the other skeletal dysplasias do not have hypomineralization. The other thing is that you often don't see the spine as well. So the hypomineralization, you could see it in the skull, in the skull bone, or the spine. Amelia is complete absence of the limb. It's quite rare. It's only case reports, um, often isolated, so often not associated with 
um, syndromes. And you can see this picture. I, I got it from the um, fetus.net because I didn't have any. But you can see in the 3D, we actually you see that there's no limbs. This is different from acuria, which is absence of, of a hand. And again, if you see here, this is the 2D. So you see this is one arm. You see the, the um, humerus, radius, nulna, and this is the hand on one side. And the other side, you see this is probably the, the humerus here and the radius, nulna, but there's no hand on that side. And you see this is the 3D picture, 3D image. You can see there's no hand. This is a baby. So this is part of a limb reduction defects, which is likely it's rare. It's only one in 20,000 uh, births. Um, it has different names in the literature. Could be called limb deficiency or congenital amputation. Um, in about half of the cases, actually multiple. So if you actually notice that there's one that's affected, go and look for the rest um, um, on, on other sides, for the rest of the limbs, because it could be multiple. About a quarter of them have associated abnormalities. It could be associated with syndromes, but they're usually sporadic, which means the risk of recurrence is very low, indeed, usually one off. The other thing is that don't forget that there could be associated with amniotic band syndrome, so go and look for amniotic band syndrome. Ask the woman whether she's taking any medications or exposure to teratogen, and it could be because of vaxillar, vaxillar accident that you might not even you might never be able to prove. So, for example, I don't know a laser for twin twin transfusion syndrome, and then later you see one of the babies have um, limb reduction defects. So again, this is a forearm, and you expect to see a hand here, and it's not there. And again, this is a 3D. You see the arm, forearm, forearm short, and then there is no there is no hand. About Fucomilia, Fucomilia, or the other term is called a seal limp. It's something that's very usual. Anybody, when you say Fucomilia, people think of the salidomide exposure. You hardly see anybody who had a salidomide exposure. So if you see a case like this, it's unlikely to be because of salidomide. Um, but do think of this um, potential syndromes. So Robert syndrome, which is autosomal um, recessive. So there is a chance, 25% chance of recurrence, and it's usually affecting all the limbs and um, can have fissure cleft as well. The TAR syndrome, which is um, thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome, and the GRIP syndrome. So Focomelia, a poor prognosis, and think of associated um, syndromes, or ask about exposure, about uh, maybe drug history. So this is a list of drugs that can potentially cause skeletal abnormalities. And that's from warfarin, valproate, antiepileptic, methotrexate. So a woman was taking methotrexate and got pregnant. Vitamin A, phenytoin, alcohol, and cocaine. Cocaine in particular could be linked to limb reduction defects. What about the aplasia or hyperplasia of the radius or the ulna? And that usually causes club hand. So the club hand could be either radial or ulnar. The radial is the one that's more common or more frequent um, and often associated with syndromes and is often have absent or hypoplastic um, thumb and absent radius. The ulna is, is less frequent, it's usually isolated, not commonly associated with um, syndromes and, and it can vary from something maybe um, mild, so maybe just a mild deviation of the hand, to complete absence of the ulna. So if you were to choose, ulnar club hand is better than radial club hand. But certainly radial club hand is the one that's more frequent. So here in this in, in the 2D, you see this is um, the, the humerus, this is the ulna, this is the hand, there's no radius, this is the 3D. I mentioned that it's come or think about syndromes with the uh, um, radial uh, club hand and the syndromes Holt Oram syndrome. What what in Holt Oram syndrome if you think there might be Holt Oram syndrome, which which organ you look for? Heart. 
a heart, a heart, because they usually have congenital heart abnormality. Um, think about Fanconi anemia and TAR, so it's thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome. So if you find, if you see a baby like that, think of this um, syndromes. <coughs> and obviously get in touch with your genetic colleague. Um, so this is a baby that had a Fanconi anemia, and again, this is a humerus, this is Alna, and you see this is the, the hand, and this is with a TAR, thrombocytopenia absent radius, and again, this is, you can see the Alna, there's no radius, and this is the hand. The other thing that we need to think about is trisomy 18. So trisomy 18 is, you can commonly, um, you see the um, absent radius, so you see this radial um, club hand. Another the differential diagnosis that you need to rule out is water. Yeah, water, vertebral abnormalities, anatresia, tracheosophageal fistula, and renal abnormalities. Polydactyly, <coughs> it could be either postaxial or preaxial. So postaxial is on the other side, and the preaxial is on the radial side, or on the thumb. And which is more common? The postaxial. The postaxial. And it's usually isolated, and it's relatively common. It's usually autosomal dominant, so it usually be family history. Maybe the parents, one of the parents, or the siblings had polydactyly already. It tend to be more common in, um, in Afro-Caribbean people compared to other ethnic backgrounds. So the literature would suggest that actually if you see it in a white baby, that maybe that you would be more concerned about syndromes compared to if you see it in an in a, in a, uh, Afro-Caribbean uh, uh, mother. Um, it could vary, so it could be just like a skin tag that easy to remove and not functioning, to actually could be complete digit with complete flexion extension. So it, there's a huge variation in, in the way that polydactyly can present. The other thing that we often talk about post-axial and pre-axial, but actually there is a central polydactyly as well. So you can get um, a finger, it's usually between the long and the ring finger, often bilateral, often autosomal dominant and associated with hand and foot abnormalities. So it can vary. Um, the opposite from polydactyly, too many digits, to oligodactyly, so you have too few digits. And actually, this is um, commonly associated with um, syndromes or other abnormalities. So we had, at St. George's, we had a, a case recently. The only thing we picked up at that point was oligodactyly. Actually, when we did an R CVS, an array, it came back as abnormal. So array abnormalities, and then later you, you pick up the heart abnormalities and you pick up other things. But that was the first thing that um, we noticed. Syndactyly, which is fusion of the digits, and it could be just bony, um, so the two bones are fused, or skin. Uh, often the skin is missed during the pregnancy, so often we pick up the bony ones. And it could be, so it could, the, the, the fusion, it could be all the way through, so until the end, until the top of the fingers, it's called complete syndactyly, or it could be incomplete. So you have this fusion and then there's separation to the, to the tip of the, of the fingers. Again, syndactyly is, can, can be uh, isolated, but could be also associated with um, other genetic abnormalities or syndromes or other abnormalities. Ectrodactyly, which has um, other terminology, like, like lobster claw deformity, and you can see why it's got this term. Um, the other thing is split hand, split foot, ectrodermal dysplasia cleft syndrome, or the EEC syndrome, so ectrodactyly, ectodermal dysplasia cleft syndrome. So you see, it's almost like a V-shape, or there's a cleft in the hands and feet. The EE syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition, often affects the four extremities, so the two hands and the two feet. Um, usually the abnormalities or the deformities are more severe in the hands compared to the feet, and they can have a wide or varying spectrum of ectodermal um, defects, varying from dry skin or sparse, sparse hair, hair or dental defects to defects of the tear. So, so could we have associated abnormalities? But the cardinal feature, the one that we can pick up antenatally, is this um, V-shape or the cleft or the split hands and feet. There are two types, atypical and atypical, which is either with this V-shape or U-shape, but I don't think we need, to, we need to go through these details. 
Okay, what, what, what we are familiar with, we're familiar with clenched hands, of course, because of the risk of uh, trisomy 18, and the thunder gap because it's a marker of trisomy 21, or Down syndrome. So here, again, so you see this is a feet, big toe, the rest of the toes, and you have a big um, gap, the thunder gap, and this is uh, the fist of the trisomy 18. <coughs> Talibus. So this is a case of talibus at, at 12 weeks. It's about one in 1,000. Um, of course, if it's isolated, it <coughs> has good outcome. But actually, what we're concerned about is that it could be the first sign you see of a progressive disorder when you later you would start seeing the arthrogryposis or uh, the, the, the rest of the joints being affected or part of the fetal akinesia deformation sequence. So if you find talibus, look for other abnormalities offer CVS or, um, or karyotype or array CGH, and you must follow up this pregnancy because there might be other features that become apparent only at the follow-up scans. So if you, if you think it's isolated at this stage, you could be relatively reassuring, but not entirely reassuring because other things could be apparent at a later stage. Arthrogryposis, which you have fixed um, flexion or extension, uh, of the joints tend to be more severe distal, the distal joints, compared to the proximal joints. Um, is it always fatal? Yes, you're absolutely right. And I, I um, got caught up, so I had a patient and I, with arthrogryposis, give her really poor prognosis, high chance the baby would die, really terrible outcome, um, and she continued with the pregnancy. And then my, um, my genetic colleague came back to me and she said, oh, I've, I saw this baby at the age of three months and it's still alive. And, and the woman said, oh, you told her the baby is likely to die. Um, so the baby didn't die, but the baby is, is, have very poor outcome. So it's not always fatal. Um, the movements, I don't know, I think that the videos are not working, but it doesn't matter. You can see that the baby is not moving. Often they have polyhydramnias. I've never seen it in the first trimester. I don't know whether people like here uh, have seen it in the first trimester, fetal akinesia um, sequence. It's about one in 3,000. It's actually very variable, so it can result from a number of abnormalities. So it's not just skeletal abnormalities. It could be actually neurological, could be muscular, could be connective tissue or skeletal. So it's really quite a, a wide range of abnormalities that can result in it. Um, often what we pick up is a bilateral talibus that actually progressively becomes the fixed flexion or extension deformities of um, all the joints. Um, and as I said, that there's often we develop polyhydramnias in the second half of the pregnancy. I've seen it even at around 20 weeks uh, because of lack of swallowing. As I mentioned, the chest or the, the, the evaluation of the chest in cases with skeletal abnormalities is really important. Because skeletal dysplasia, lethal skeletal dysplasia, they usually die because of um, not just a small chest, because of the pulmonary hypoplasia. This is, this is the main reason why they die. So how do you evaluate the chest size? Well, you can see this is like um, the corkscrew, or champagne cork, uh, corkscrew, and that, that uh, sagittal view, and you see the chest smaller than the abdomen. But really, I think the best view to be able to, to evaluate the chest is actually when you get a cross-section of the chest at the level of the full chamber, you split your screen into two, you have the chest at the level of the full chamber, and you, you, you go down with the same magnification and have a cross-section in the abdomen. And the ratio should be between 0 0.8 to 1. So if it's less than that, this is, will be an indication of a small chest. And this is a chest, a small chest, and a, and a fetus in the first trimester. I mentioned the fetal head or the face is, is commonly affected in conditions with skeletal abnormalities or skeletal dysplasias. And they can vary from maybe a large head size, like macrocephaly, or maybe a frontal posting or micrognasia or hypertellurism. This is the coronal section. You see this is a two, um, the, the, the white separation of the, um, the two um, eyes. The micrognesia can vary from quite severe to maybe mild. The clover leaf, which is a, the unusual shape of the skull, is quite characteristic of senatophoric dysplasia. Often you see it in type 2, but rarely you might see it in type 1. 
but it's more characteristic of type 2 um, skeletal dysplasia. So as I mentioned, when you have a baby with skeletal abnormality, you just have to be systematic, and you have this list and comment on each one of them, whether it's normal or abnormal. So it could be just the head is normal, for example, in some condition. That might give you some help or clue to work out what is the exact um, diagnosis of skeletal dysplasia. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to go through maybe three or four of the um, common skeletal dysplasias, and I'm going to show you what we published in the early signs of, um, of, of these cases, so maybe first trimester or early second trimester. So cystic dysplasia, as I mentioned earlier, the two types, type 1 and type 2, it is a common skeletal, skeletal dysplasia. Um, type 1 results from 10 genetic mutations, while type 2 results from only one genetic mutation, so it's easier to test for type 2. Type 1 is the commonest, so it's com commoner than type 2. Characteristically, you will have this curved femur or bowed femur, um, and the clover he uh, head is not common, it's seen in only in some cases. While, oops, sorry, videos are working now. Uh, while type 2, um, the femurs are usually straight, and the, the clover head, you see it more often in type 2. They're both lethal, as I mentioned, which means that the usual, and they're autosomal dominant, so they're lethal, autosomal dominant which means it's usually new mutation. And if it's new mutation, it means that the risk of recurrence is very small, but not zero. So the risk of recurrence would be less than 1%, because in case of the germline mosaicism, for example. So you have to, so in a way, you'll be optimistic in terms of the low risk of recurrence, but you have to be cautious of not saying there is no risk of recurrence. Um, and I said, uh, in this case, you see frontal bossing, but often the frontal bossing is quite relative in these cases. So for, this is an atrophic dysplasia, and you see that here you see the small, very small chest. You see the short trips, often have very fat legs. Um, you see the, well, hold on, if I, maybe in the next one, we'll see. Yeah, here we are. So here you see this fat legs. Do you see the, the, the curved long poems? And you see that you see the small chest in a second. So again, small chest compared to the to the abdomen. Okay. This is the the, the paper that we published um, about four or five years ago now. We looked at um, a cohort, different types of skeletal dysplasias, and we looked at the features that you could see in the first trimester. So if you are interested, so if you have time this evening, <coughs> it might be a good read. So in this paper, we found in the senatophoric dysplasia, um, cases that were seen early, we found increased nuchal translucency. And that's actually something that's common in these babies. So if you have increased nuchal, we are so obsessed about screening for Down syndrome and chromosomal abnormalities. It is true that the risk of chromosomal abnormalities in babies with increased nuclear translucency is increased, but it's not just that. So if you do the CVS and it's normal carry time, think of other um, uh, possibilities, including skeletal dysplasias, because almost in all skeletal dysplasias, uh, we found increased nuclear translucency in the first trimester. The other thing we found that the femur, the femur lens was short, less than fifth centile, but not in all cases. So some of these cases, the femur was not actually short in the first trimester. Um, in the atrophic dysplasia in the first trimester, they had pulled femur. Um, small thorax. So for example, here, you see this is, this is a cross-section in the chest, and this is a cross-section in the abdomen, and you can see it's very clear. It's not, you know, it's not debatable. You can see this chest is much smaller than, than the abdomen. You see, this is a frontal bossing, and the head is, I think, is probably uh, quite large compared to the rest of the body. This is the longitudinal section in, in the chest and the abdomen, and this is the, the head, which is, I think, abnormal shape. You could argue that it looks like a clover leaf. <coughs> so in these cases, in the first trimester or early in pregnancy, we could actually see a lot of these features in the first trimester. But I have to, you have to be quite honest Actually, a lot of these cases were referred because they had family history or they had a previous pregnancy affected. 
So almost we were looking for the risk of recurrence. I'm not sure that in all cases where you just had a woman with large nuclear translucency that you'd be looking for all these features. I, th I don't think we do. <coughs> Maybe perhaps we should. But as I said, these cases were because they were seen in special center and a, lot, a, a proportion of them had previous history. So we were looking for the features. If we move on to another condition, achondrogenesis, um, it is a lethal sclerotic dysplasia. There are two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 tends to be autosomal recessive, which means the risk of recurrence about 25%, while type 2 is usually sporadic and autosomal dominant. There's one uh, difference between type 1 and type 2, that type 1, the, the, de the poor mineralization affects both the skull and the vertebra. So you, you almost don't see the spine. The spine is very poorly ossified. Uh, while type 2 affects mainly the vertebra, but you normal mineralization of the skull. So in, the, in this paper, we found in, the, in, the, in early in pregnancy, these cases of echondrogenesis had increased nuchal translucency, had short femur, they had evidence of uh, fractures um, and bent femur, they had small thorax, they had hypomineralization, but sometimes normal mineralization of the skull. Some of them presented with high drops, and the vertebra of the spine was hypomineralized in all the cases. Osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, it's about one in two in 10,000. Um, what what's the pathology? What's the problem of osteogenesis imperfecta? So, so cyanotophoric dysplasia and achondroplasia is a genetic mutation with the FGFR M3 gene. Osteogenesis imperfecta is because of defect, defect in the quantity or the quality of the collagen that's produced. So if it's an abnormal quantity, it's type 1. And if it is abnormal quality, that's type 2, 3, and 4. There are four types of osteogenesis imperfecta. Majority of them is because of new mutation. Um, but sometimes, rarely, it could be autosomal uh, recessive. Um, the recurrence risk is about 5 to 7%. And they can vary. So uh, osteogenesis imperfecta is the mildest form. That means they can survive. And you can come across them. Um, while actually um, other, other types are often fa fatal, so it's usually more severe. So type 1 is the mildest. So in these cases, we found in the, in the early in pregnancy that the, these fetuses had increased nuchal translucency. They had short femur. They had fracture that could be seen in, in the first trimester. Had small thorax, had short beaded ribs here. This is a, you see this is a short beaded ribs. You see this is the hypomineralization of the skull. <laughs> this is the bent femur. Um, Ellis van Grevelt, they're not, it's not common. It's another sclerotic dysplasia. And again, you see, there's quite, there's quite common features, the common themes in these babies. The nuchal, the, fe the short femur, the bold femur, the small chest. These are the features that we saw in the first trimester which is indicative of sclerotic dysplasia, but does not really help you to, to, the, to reach the exact diagnosis. In these cases, they had polydactyly, so polydactyly can be clue to limit your differential diagnosis to certain conditions, um, and had cardiac defect. So Ellis van Grevelt um, is, again, quite commonly associated with um, cardiac abnormalities. So you see this is the polydactyly here. You see here, this is the um, heart abnormalities, and the short ribs, small chest. So um, my last point really is just to um, uh, make sure that you, you're aware of the fact that there is a non-invasive prenatal um, testing for um, a number of sclerotic dysplasias. So this is, was on cyanotophoric dysplasia. So nowadays, if you suspect there's a baby with cyanotophoric dysplasia, you can actually send the maternal uh, blood sample to test for um, free fetal DNA. It's easier for type two cytophoric uh, dysplasia because there's only one G mutation compared to the 10 G mutations in type one. And it's also available for achondroplasia. So when I mentioned earlier that achondroplasia is not something that you can rule out or diagnose really in the first trimester, but certainly uh, I came across a family that already the mother have achondroplasia and, and she'll come every time she gets pregnant for the scans 
And we do the scans, they say, okay, it's fine, things are okay, but we can't really tell you until 25 weeks whether this baby is affected or not. But for, for someone like her, you could potentially actually send a, a blood sample and do NIBT. Um, it's also that currently there are a number of uh, uh, sclera displays that you can do NIBT for a number of sclera displays. You can't do for all of them, but you can do for about maybe six of them. So my take home message really is the accurate diagnosis of sclera dysplasia before birth, it is challenging, even among the experts. Um, we, can, we could potentially offer targeted molecular, molecular diagnosis, but you have to you have to suspect it on the ultrasound scan first. And potentially the, the use of cell free, free fetal DNA potentially would be helpful in um, the genetic diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asma. This is always a very difficult talk, and you managed the, really to be extremely clear and uh, make it very interesting. Um, are there some uh, questions for Asma? Many questions. Many questions. Too many, in actual fact. Okay. Well, we'll see if there is something from the... Asma, no, there is, yeah. I, I have a question. Will, will you be able to, to speak a little about... I know, I know that it's not early diagnosis about the achondroplasia and the, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the bone. Yes, the achondroplasia. So the achondroplasia, usually the, the, the measurement of, uh, of, the, of the femur is within normal range um, until about 25 weeks when you actually start seeing the shortening or the femur becomes less than fifth centile, uh, which means that's often missed. I mean, in a place where I work here, I work in the UK, when you have two scans routinely in the, in the, in the during pregnancy, which means that um, this woman will have her last scan at 20 weeks, it's normal, the femur is with normal range, so often most of these cases are not picked up. It could be picked up later when this woman developed polyhydramnios, for example, or for whatever reason she had a scan, and then you pick up that there is a short, um, short uh, femur. Um, there are other features, so it's not just the femur, which can be sometimes bold, so it's not, it's not always straight, but you, there are a number of other features that you could see or you could look for, like frontal bossing, often the, the, the head is big, maybe on the 90th or 95th centile, um, you could see this trident hand, they have short stubby fingers. Um, they could sometimes, they might have a small chest, but achondroplasia is not lethal, so it's the commonest non-lethal um, sclera dysplasia. They can have polyhydramnios. Um, we published on um, uh, the proximal femoral angle. So this is the angle there, almost like the angle between the, 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 the head of the, fe of the, the femur and the metaphysis. So during pregnancy, you actually really don't see the epiphysis. So it's between the epiphysis and, and the metaphysis. Um, and we, we reported, and it wasn't us, the first the people that um, described it the first time. It was a French group. And they described that actually this angle is wide. It's almost obtuse in babies with achondroplasia. And we showed that in a number of fetuses in the third trimester that they had wide angle. And it seems among the old ultrasound features that were described, this angle was present in more than 80% of, of these babies. And then recently we published with Rabi um, on um, five cases on a second trimester when we went back and looked at the images and we measured the angle. And it seems that this angle tend to be wider in the second trimester. So perhaps maybe it might be in the future, maybe a way that we could actually look at these fetuses in the second trimester before the femur is very short and be able to say this fetus is at risk of achondroplasia. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. and now it will be 